Mariana. 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 <laughs> All right, so Don't this is Emily Atherton, director of the Healthy Family Formula and host and producer of the Children's Health Summit 4. In response to the rapid rise in conditions such as autism, cancer, ADHD, gastrointestinal distress, anxiety, depression, asthma, skin conditions, learning disabilities, and autoimmunity, the topic of this year's summit is preventing and reversing childhood chronic illness. And today I am very excited to be interviewed by one of my brilliant Healthy Family Formula Family Health Coach trainees, Ita Tiegman. So I just want to give um, Ita the floor to introduce herself and our topic for today. Ita, it's all yours. Yes, thank you very much. Well, I've been a health warrior since my childhood. Um, now a grandmother of Actually, I just had a new grandson yesterday. Uh -huh. So now that makes 11 grandchildren, thank God. And, um, you know, I've grown up seeing people wanting the best for themselves and just really not knowing how to do it. That is, that is something that's been burning in me. I see my own kids making, like, mistakes in living and healthy living. And that just seems like to be the society, how it is. So I've been, as a child, since a child, I've been listening to Gary Null and, uh, you know, Dr. McCola and all the, you know, Dr. Pressman, all the health gurus. And I, you know, modified my, my, my lifestyle based on that. My kids saw it growing up. So many of them are like themselves, you know, good role models for their family and for people around them. But once, um, and I'm, I've been teaching, I, I have a master's in early childhood and special ed, and that was to me very important to teach the kids how to be healthy, how to think for themselves, how to make good choices. And um, once I saw um, Carla post that she's looking for, you know, an army of healthy family formula practitioners, I jumped on it and uh, we met. And uh, I am very, very grateful. I just see that this is something that, just this is the time we really need to do this we need to start preventing because people can really children can really live up to their greatness and Carla thank you for you know starting this so if you're ready I can start interviewing you yeah that'd be and awesome. uh, I just want to say thank okay. you for that army we need you and you're just a really wonderful addition and, and it's been a real pleasure so yes please do let's start thank you Okay, being that I started um, thinking about my questions on April 1st, I said, oh, isn't that interesting? April Fools. We've been living April Fools. <laughs> so I wanted to ask you, because you and I grew up at a time when every day was seriously April Fools in regard to our human desire to have thriving health. Mm -hmm. But we were conned into believing that man-made, sterile, and instant everything trumped divinely natural, laden with friendly little microbes and easily perishable and patiently produced. I mean, that's it. You know, fast food, everything instant, instant cleansers, everything. It just trumps everything the way we used to live. And so we want to know, is it possible? Do you think it's possible for humanity to be ready to turn the page on the calendar? We need to like, get past the I, That's an awesome question because I think actually you've really captured I think the reason why we're so sick is because we're sort of we've sort of been duped into believing that faster is better and convenience is king and and really we're finding that convenience is not convenient at all because it's very inconvenient to be sick and all it does is lead us to shortcuts ignoring our bodies ignoring even our children and our relationships in pursuit of something we don't even know what we're being fast for. Like, why are we hurrying up? Like, what are we hurrying up toward? Like, death? I mean, really, there's nothing to be fast for. It doesn't make any sense. So, yeah, I do think that we can, um, you know, do something better. I think we actually have to. Um, if we're going to turn around this whole epidemic of chronic illness, and not just ch childhood chronic illness, but also chronic illness for, you know, us people who are in the middle, you know, caring for the young and, and the old, the elderly are actually, um, you know, have been suffering from chronic illness, you know, for a while now, um, but also are starting, things are starting to crop up for them that are actually kind of new as well. So I, I think that we can, I think that we have to, and I think that 
Um, there are many ways that we can do that. It's not like it's like impossible, right? It's just what is really challenging is that it's going to take a whole shift in how we see health, what we understand to be health, and what we understand to be those tools to get us um, that to that state, right? So those are those are actually um, things that we might take for granted or think that are really benign, you know, like eating well and sleeping well. And we could talk about that and get into more detail later, but if you like, but um, those things are actually the, are foundational. And, and, but I think the first thing to do is shift that mindset um, of, you know, you know, convenience is king, faster is better, um, to really actually slow down and smell the roses, to enjoy each other's company, to, you know, walk down, take your kids down to the riverbank. I mean, we spent so much time by the riverbank when my children were small. And even like, you know, when they were a little older too. Now, I mean, I like to, I got to drag them a little more because it's harder to herd those cats when they're older. They've all got their own lives. But um, I think that that was really where mental and physical health were at the best is when we were and are practicing those natural ways of living and being and just being with each other. It's taking the time to cook, taking the time to clean up after we cook, taking the time to just, you know, um, play games or, you know, pay attention to our bodies, ask those questions like, why do I have a headache? And then figuring out what to do about that rather than just ignoring it, taking a pill, <laughs> you know? And um, yeah, so I do think it's possible. Uh, I think it's actually critical that we do that. Critical. Critical. Yeah. However, most... You live in the country, you're talking about nature. I think the majority of in, in industry, you know, industrial countries, people don't even know what nature is. Yeah, I know. I mean, everything about it is unnatural and they've grown up and they've been educated in that atmosphere. Yeah. So what do you think it'll take to educate? Because the government's not doing it, you know, like that's not part of the education. Yeah, so, well, well, like anything, like what we're doing here, it's a grassroots. It's like a mom's talking to moms, dad's talking to dads, parents talking to parents, grandparents. It's like, it's this always having this conversation and making sure we, we keep it at the forefront of our minds and not forgetting that because I think often if people are, we get down the road of like, you know, a cancer awareness, let's say. Like, look, you know, everybody wants to be aware of cancer, but nobody's really aware of how to actually handle cancer or deal with it. Or, uh, you know, so always keeping that conversation in every single conversation we have about those little details that we get caught up in, right? So we're getting caught up in like, how do we fight this disease? How do we, you know, what medication do we produce? So what, what studies do we need? But really like backing up and getting that perspective again, like, wait, it's all about slowing down, finding the causes, dealing with those root causes, you know, setting up the foundation for good health and healing. So, and it's not benign. It's like you, this is like building a house. You don't build a house on, on nothing. You need a foundation. You have to have a foundation. And this, if we're constantly reminding ourselves and the people we work with, let's say we're practitioners or um, our family, within our own families, within our own communities, if we're always returning to that conversation, I think that we can turn that tide. And it's, it's pretty tough, I think, in our environment too. It's because tough. It's tough because you're talking about living in an industrial country, in, you know, a Dutch industrialized country or in cities or um, in a country that it allows advertising for pharmaceuticals on TV 24 hours a day. I mean, there's a media that we, you know, all these things that we need to sort of always deprogram our own families. <laughs> I feel like, you know, once they're exposed to that over and over, we're always having to sort of live differently and think differently. And sometimes even us parents can get to that point where we're like, oh, this will be so easy to go to McDonald's and, you know, take a Tylenol. I can't handle this child crying because they have a headache or, you know, they're sick and they have this fever and I'm scared and I don't know what to do. It's, it's, it does feel easier, but I guarantee you that it isn't because if you, like our family, we have been through a lot and I know I work with many, many families that said, I wish I would have known then, or I wish I would have taken the time, or I wish that somebody would have helped me with this back then before my child had type one diabetes, depression, um, ADHD, you know, like learning disabilities, all those things that I mentioned in the intro, those things are preventable. And once they, they happen, you can rectify them, but it's, 
essential that we, we are always reminding ourselves that this is key, this slowing down, and not to over, overwhelm ourselves all the time, not only our immune systems with all this, the crap we take in with our minds and our bodies and our, you know, with the chemicals and the poor food, lack of sleep, all that stuff, not only the stuff we take in that way, but also the stuff that we fill our lives with, right? Because we are, we're like kind of holy now. <laughs> like we have, we have holes. We, we've created gaps in our health and trying to fill those, those gaps up or those, um, you know, emotional spaces with, you know, excessive, um, you know, screen time or um, things like, uh, there was something else I was going to mention that I can't remember. It started floating away from me. Oh, activities that are just like, just too much, you know, like it's too much. And it, it, we just need to not put on the brakes and stop. I mean, sometimes we need to do that. And, and our bodies will force us to do that if we don't. But we need to slow down. We just need to slow down, roll down the windows, you know, and, and smell the roses. I'm, I'm all about the metaphor. Um, so yeah, you, you've got, you've got a lot of fans. You've got a lot of fans who are on the same page. You have people that hit rock bottom and realize, oh, we got to make a change in our lives. But I see in my community, people are just so addicted that yeah. they're just not interested. They're so not interested. They just want to follow, you know, because it's just going to take too much out of them, you know, to change um change a diet learn about what fever is and not just run for the tylenol and i i think i'm just wondering do you see a burgeoning of awareness as a result of your efforts with you know us or the army that you're creating to educate and create a crucial paradigm shift in yeah, the healthy I living do. space i mean i do i do and these things happen in ways that you actually would least expect and maybe even the ways that you don't even necessarily want to do i mean uh, for instance okay i'm a uh, lot just I'll do anything yeah, yeah. Like yesterday. Okay, so um, there are those. So there's practical things like you were talking about being in a in an urban environment, right? And so like we don't even have access to nature. I do live in the country, but I did that by choice. I grew up in the city, and what and even living in the city, we visited the riverbank. That's not those years where my children were young, young. I we lived in the city, and when I talk about being on the riverbank or out park at parks and stuff, we were on the campus of the university in our city. We were lucky to have a beautiful city. Um, with lots of access to the river and we used to go spend like literally six hours and I know people are like six hours but literally like hours and hours on the riverbank when they were younger because at that time you're actually almost forced to slow down because they you know you're putting on coats you're you know someone's muddy someone peed their pants you know like you're always oh, wow. so, you're, so like the stroller wheel fell off like all these things happen to us and, you know, we were always having to slow down. We'd spend hours at the library. We would go swimming once a week. We, we, you know, like they did dishes, whether they were done well or not, you know, especially when they liked to do it. Like, so all these things that we were doing was part of our life. And so there was a pocket of people that was living similarly to us that we were learning a lot from actually, because I was way, way more medicalized and, and away from my natural being than they were. So they were ahead of me. So I started hanging out with people who were ahead of me. But then there are all people that were kind of like not really getting what I was doing, but were still sort of pulled along by me. So it's like this, um, wherever we're at, right? Yeah, we attract yeah. that both sides. Like we, we sort of lean toward the people we want to learn from, but we also pull, to, pull the people in who are sort of interested in what we're doing because we see us, they see us leading by example. That's one thing is leading by example. That's what we need to do. That's, we need to get, we need to get those people that want to be the examples. It. We do it. And then it's like, okay, let's say you're the first one in your neighborhood to stop spraying your lawn. Okay. And your neighbors are still spraying their lawn. They're going to affect you and your children's health. And there's like, Ooh, okay. There's a need for you to actually communicate with your neighbors. What do you think we could do instead? This is maybe some of this, this is my concern. And then, you know, go from there. But I mean, of course, you know, there's a lot of tact that needs to happen there. You don't want any feuds in your neighborhood. You want to create a community of people who care about each other and each other's health, right? So there, you know, so there's those kinds of things and ways to actually communicate. It's the same thing with that at your school. You know, it's like, hey, look, you know, if you, if you, you know, do you do know that this lighting is actually conducive to really poor thinking and, you know, like ill health and, Hey, like if we tried, you know, a full spectrum light, maybe that would help with the kids, you know, and they, they, 
be behaving better and it'd be a lot less stressful for your teachers and they're gonna stop taking all those sick days and just are quitting you know or losing their interest in teaching at all like it's a whole like people need to understand how these things kind of sort of work and then just making those small changes one at a time and you get a quick few few quick wins and then people start really realizing so that, that it's beneficial and so just last night I was gonna tell you Ita that there was um, a parent who came to me and we we're like it's like one of those people that when you see them their family just goes, no, because they know they're going to be waiting for you to be talking for a long time. <laughs> like, they're, her kids are just like, no, 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 because they think we're like, they saw me before I start. <laughs> oh, yeah. we're like, just drawn to each other. We're just like, oh, I'm so glad I saw you, but I have to let you go because I know we're going to be here for two hours. But um, so one of those parents, I ran into her and we, well, we're friends. She's not just a parent of a friend, you know, we're friends. And I, so I ran into her and she said, okay, I'm doing some X, Y, Z with the art program here. I'm just volunteering my time. She's an artist and she also teaches at the university. She teaches art. And so, and we, they have an art program at the school that our girl, our two, our children, our teenagers go to, two of them. And, uh, but she wants to update it and make it, you know, really a powerful program that, you know, instead of just going here, draw this line, draw that line, really like ramp it up. So she's been speaking to the school about that. And I've been talking to the school a lot about, you know, creative arts and, and I'm a writer as well. So I do a lot of creative work and teaching creative writing, which is like, I think just the most beautiful way and one of the most beautiful expressive ways. And it helps people actually like the teenagers, man, it's like they find themselves, they find their voice, they tell their stories and they get so much more confident and, and explore their world. It's like, it's like we we're talking about Ita about slowing down. The arts are a really beautiful way to slow down um, and to actually explore what it is to be human, not to do, but to be, right? All right, so. That's why they took me out of the schools. Yeah, well, that's what we should teach at school. That and meditation, that's like, that should be like core. That's, that's core. Meditation and movement, you know, get up, get outside, turn on your brain. Not none of the sit, 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 but okay, that's another story. But anyway, so she was saying how, um, she watched they're starting a garden at the school and I thought that's right, right? and so I but right. I thought oh and then she's gonna want me to be involved and I'm thinking I have no time for this at all so I, I sort of start like so you kind of like these things get started and you go not in the ways that you might think that they would be started but somebody has an idea and they do something else and it might be just as wonderful but it might not be the way you had plan like you might have thought oh well we're gonna do these arts programs whatever and that's gonna be great and I can handle that but then you're like a garden for goodness sake and then I'm gonna I got you know we have to do this and that and we have to get people to do it yeah so but it was beautiful this I so I went I quickly thought through that and I went no this is a good thing this is what we want this is like you know because they're enthusiastic yeah, yeah. That we can get them to think about exactly so I mean so yes I think that lighting fires um living by example and and letting those fires kind of just you know like other people stoke them you know trusting that they're gonna do what they are inspired to do and that is you know that it's going to be a beneficial thing for all of you you know so i think that yeah lighting fires and 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 starting other people sort of at least planting this seed right that they're going to be thinking a little bit differently you know um and I know, you know, some of us, we, we tend to want to just like preach. We want to say, this is how it should be. And, you know, this is not healthy the way you're living. And we need to do this and that. And, and we really need to let people come to their own conclusions about what they're going to actually do to make, to get to that end point of health as well. Because um, I think that there are a lot of ideas and a lot of initiatives that kind of come out of that that we would never expect or be able to just do on our own. Like, I mean, the, the, the point is not to enable people and to like do everything for everyone. I, the point is to actually and that's what I like about empower them. Program. Yeah, yeah, to empower them to do it themselves. Okay, yes, you were gonna say what, Ita? I'm saying you don't preach. I love your program. You, you're so enthusiastic. You create such a desire in us to like build each other with whatever is our niche and I see how you're different. I haven't taken any other coaching courses, but how do you how do you frame your course as different than I mean there's so many more coaching courses that are coming out there. 
what is different about your course in regard to the individual and what you, you know, what your big, hairy, audacious goals are for the community, for the world at large? <laughs> What's different about it? HFF coach, uh, practitioner training. Yeah, I love your um, adjectives. Big, what did you say? Hairy, big, hairy. B-hag. You heard of B-hag. Oh, yeah. B-hag. Big, hairy, audacious goal. <laughs> audacious. Love it. Okay. I love that. I, I didn't make it up. <laughs> well, okay. So, um, I like the reason why I started this program. I, I appreciate you asking this because for people listening or watching, this is not like the, she's asking me questions that I actually didn't know <laughs> she's gonna ask. But I, I really I love the opportunity to speak about the program because the reason why I did it in the first place is why I do anything. It's like, I, I mean, I, I kind of sort of ask myself this question all the time. I go, why are you doing that? I was like, because I just want to. Like, I just, because I see a need and feel a need. It's like I wrote a piece about that on my blog once with, the, you know, um, the, that character in, uh, what's that, robots. And so he says, see a need, feel a need. And that's kind of like how I see it, you know, because I, my family, let's face it, we went through hell, okay? And it, and it lasted a lot of years. And the only reason why we got through that is because I was, I'm pretty tenacious, I'm, I'm already, it was a skilled researcher. I knew how to do that. I knew what questions to ask. And I knew I had, I, I was already a critical thinker. So this is one of those fundamental things too, like, you know, where it comes to being able to make a shift in your mindset is because you might not have all the answers or even have the right perspective at first that's conducive to your benefit, right? But if you're a critical thinker, you can always shift that because you realize that you can change that. You can change it. And so I started doing that and I, and I really learned a ton about stuff I had no idea. I mean, I, I was warm to the idea of natural childbirth, warm to the idea of, of natural living. And I was doing that, but I also was interfering with my, those own processes by my medicalized, what I've been taught, you know, in the medicalized mindset about what health is. Pill for an ill, cover up symptoms. And I just, I just had no idea that, oh, why don't we deal with the cause? And so when my daughter was, uh, and like, what? yeah. And yeah. yes. And then once you realize that, like once you really get that, you, there's no going back. And then there's just like ex explore and, you know, and so going through all of these things, like, you know, this big D day diagnosis and um, having to handle, like going through the medical system and feeling like, with with practitioners and, and providers like healthcare providers that I thought had my back like I really had no doubt they could help us and all that stuff and then I was like why are we getting pushed off to the side what 15 minutes isn't going to be long enough to discuss this and so you know it was like we were going for sniffles and stuff like that but before but now we really needed the support and we weren't getting it and we were actually getting pushed back and I'm not talking just one or two, I'm talking 10, 15, like literally exhausting my resources, traveling, spending thousands of dollars, you know, in the US or going to conferences, taking coaching program after coaching program and still not finding that I had the support that we needed, that we could have had in one package with one person had they been trained properly, right? Had they known how to, the physiology, had they known how to use that to find, um, you know, what was going on with the person, how to recognize the symptoms, to find the root cause, and then how to address all of those. And those are like, there are certain root causes that cause everything, right? So, I mean, there, you know, there are, it, it's, it's really a fantastic way to understand health. Um, and then also the aspect of advocacy, you know, being able to get the right support you need and if you don't understanding that you are hiring your healthcare professionals and that there is this not this hierarchy where you are kind of like here and then there's this authority here because we are the authority on our own health exactly. we, right we are the ones that are we're at the point where these are our families our children they those children are not going to mean as much to us to anybody else as they do to us they're never going to, they're not going to mean as much to anybody else as they do to us. And so 
We are the authority. We're the ones that need to synthesize. And it is our, it's our responsibility to do so. And that's it. People think, oh, that's such a big responsibility. But you do it every day. You do it even when you give up that, that some of that um, authority to other people because you're still deciding to trust somebody else. So you still make those decisions. And so, and also dealing with trauma, dealing with, um, you know, what, like other causal factors that are mental and emotional and dealing with, um, you know, helping families to actually find the support that they need. So that coach needs to bring all of that together for these families so that they can have a cohesive plan. Cause that's another thing that I was never getting was a plan. What do we do? Yeah. You can tell me what we have. So yeah, we got type one diabetes, we've got depression, we've got severe anemia, we've got parasites, we've got whatever we've got, but then now what do we do? And then it's not just take one pill, it's actually a whole approach for a whole person, for a whole family. So that's what I found was completely missing. I, actually, really all of that was missing, all of it. Like, and I was, nothing was explained, and if I asked questions, it would be like, why are you asking this question? It would be a burden to answer, because there just wasn't even any time. And even the ones that really wanted to help us, they just couldn't. They weren't set up to do that in the, in the system that is in place. So how do we work on They weren't told, yeah. Yeah, and the cost? Astronomical. I mean, most people who, uh, you know, you, they'll say, well, like in passing, right? I'll be, you know, visiting with someone and like, like at some... I don't know, sporting event. And one of the parents will say something about their child's like, um, you know, gastro, gastro problems. They're not digesting very well. And I'm thinking, Ugh. like, where do I start? Where do I, because I know it's going to take this, a shift in a lot of areas to fix that because it's not just take a lax, right. And then it's going to clear the pipes and it'll be fine. We got to know what caused it, what's going on right now. And then we have to address all of those fundamentals. And, and it's daunting if you don't have a plan and if you don't have a cohesive way of going about this, this, this sort of progression or these steps to take. So that's what I felt I needed to teach people because it took me eight years to figure it out myself, literally. And then by that, most people don't have what you have. Most have people don't have their skills. They don't have, they, well, they don't, they don't have, have the skills. Maybe that, yeah, and also they, they don't have the time to do that because it's like, it takes a lot of dedication and it's like, you're not going out making a million dollars while you're spending 40 or hours. the confidence. Coaching. They don't I'm have like, the confidence. Yeah, well, yeah, that's, that's true too because it's sort of like beat out of us, you know? It's because we're like, because if fear is a very motivating factor and if we are afraid you know, that, or unmotivating, right? Like if we can stop and say, oh, I guess I better do what this, this, you know, person says. And it might not even, it might be partial. It might not even be anything. And so, I mean, there's a lot of, like I actually came, went to a doctor and I knew what I, what was wrong with me. And I just needed someone to help me access the medical system. And sometimes that's what we need when we put together our team, right, of, of caregivers. And so, and we do need a team. So we do like, we're not going to be able to be schooled in everything, like a homeopath, a chiropractor, a, you know, physiotherapist, like whatever we need, we're going to have to source it, but we need to find the right places to go. And so I went and I just wanted someone to put it together, be able to do simple blood work. And she told me, I don't know how to help you. That's she, she, that's what she said. And I said, okay, well, I know how to help myself. I just need you to help me to get this, right? Like, I just need this blood work done. Otherwise, I'm going to a naturopath, which I love. I love going, but I have to pay out of pocket in Canada for a naturopathic doctor to order blood work. And you know what? It gets expensive. So anyway, so what we do too in our program, we also help people to figure out ways to manage the, the financial aspect because like you need, they need a budget, they need a plan, they need to be able to know that this is what to expect. This is what we want to see happen. And this is what we, when we need to retest, if we're going the, the testing route. So we are, I train people how to tailor those, um, those plans for each person who comes, depending on how much money they have, time, energy, and where they're at right now with their belief system and their current state of health. Long answer. That's very important. Yeah. And what niches do you see each of your, you know, tra um, practitioners going to which kind of niches? Like what, what, 
needs do you see us filling besides <coughs> children with uh, chronic disease? Okay. Um, I personally, I'm, I became a doula now, and my goal is to, um, actually, I just was talking to with a friend that has a beautiful, um, uh, like, resort apartment near yeah. the beach up, yeah. up in, like, northern Israel, and I, and I told him my, my big, hairy, audacious goal, I said, we're going to take groups of, you know, just married or, you know, first pregnancies, and we're going to take them on a spa retreat. We're going to give them like three days of how to have a healthy home, including essential oils and nutrients and grow their own little garden, like everything in three days. Take them, teach them grounding, take them to the beach, you know, like all these things. Like that's my goal is prevention. That's what I want to do. Then there's, you know, there's all the different, there's the autism, there's so many different chronic diseases. So. Is there anything that I left out that we left out, and like how we're gonna how our your practitioners will be filling um, needs? Okay, well, this is the coolest thing about it. I love that you said. I love that idea. I think that's amazing. I think it's amazing because I think like that retreat idea, plucking people out of where they are, because sometimes that becomes all you can see, and so showing them something else by taking them out of their current environment. And like, that's why travel is wonderful, you know? So you pluck that person out and you're like, they're like, oh, okay, I get this. Oh, and then they learn how to bring that back. It's like the hero's journey. You know, you go off on this hero's journey and you experience all these different things and something made you go do this journey. And then you get back and you come back and you bring all that wisdom back home and you change things at home. So I love that you mentioned that. But when and we talk about niching. Um, in the program too, and about, but the program is meant to be able to, it's a found, again, we're building the foundation of understanding about health and how to retain that. And so it, it's, it's, it's so, um, everybody gets like a grounding in that basic idea and the basic um, teaching and, you know, all that stuff, research, whatever else, the things that we're reading, um, our weekly sessions, all that stuff, the discussion that we have. And then, like you were saying, built, bringing out all of the talents of every single practitioner who comes out of the program, because everyone came in with, comes in with something different. So some people come in with like a, a, a psychology background. Some people come in with nursing. Some people come in with community, you know, um, like community advocacy, like that, which is probably the part where I probably put you, Ita, is like in that advocacy department, right? Or um, some people come in with, you know, um, like they want to work with babies, they want to, or maybe chronic illness, like we're talking about, or they want to, you know, like you said, prevention, they want to work with geriatrics, they want, they're like concerned about the rise in Alzheimer's and dementia and Parkinson's, Parkinson's, oh, yeah. right? Autoimmunity. So there's like many, I mean, some people are interested in helping children with learning disabilities, but they all intersect. So we have to understand how all of those conditions can be caused by the same set of circumstances. And so to understand that, we can really handle all of them. But when we niche in on what we're really talented at doing, then that's when all of these people go out into the world and they do what they, what they do best, right? And what they, what, how they synthesize it. So some people come out of there doing, you know, just want to work with little kids, but they still need to understand how if they want to do prevention, they need to understand how, you know, poor diet, you know, um, like uh, what are, I don't know, like, I'm forgetting now because I'm talking about Alzheimer's, of course. But I mean, all, how all these things can lead to uh -huh. <laughs> high blood sugar. Okay, like, yeah, all these things can lead to Alzheimer's in the end. So they still need to understand that when they're working with small children. They also need to understand how health at an early age, the microbiome, and like, you know, um, having a healthy, robust immune system and ha having healthy digestion, that stuff can, you know, might have affected their health later down the road. So when, if you're dealing with working with the, the geriatric population, more, more so, you still need to understand how they got there. And so, and then you also need to understand the family aspect because no one person gets well or gets ill in isolation. There's always a family aspect to that. Whether or not you are involved in your family, doesn't matter. There's still that family impacts your health and you can impact the family as well. So those things, we need to understand all of those to do any of those things. And then when we niche in, we have a much, we come from a much more robust understanding of that individual's health or that, that, that subset of people that we work with. And then that way, 
you know, if you're, if you're niching into shit like chronic illness or specifically ADHD or neurodevelopmental issues, um, or, you know, all a plethora of things. So let's say we're niching in there. Um, then that's when we get, we do more research and study and, and advanced trainings in those particular areas. So let's say we do the basics, we get everybody pretty good. You can get like really, really good knowing how to address those root, those, the heavy, the root causes and using the heavy hitters. You know, you get rid of EMF exposure, you have a good diet, you, you rest, you exercise, you sleep well, you know, all of those things that, that are the main things to take care of. Then you can say, okay, look, are there specific deficiencies in nutrients? Are there specific, um, you know, toxicities that are causing this sort of excitation of the brain or conversely, the lack of focus, okay? So there are things that we do learn that actually help people niche in depending on where their interests lie, their population that they want to work with because we do need to, you know, narrow down a little bit at times because, um, you know, due to interest or, um, you know, whatever those needs are in your area. So yeah, so, and yeah, and I think the sky's the limit when you said what kind of niches can we sort of focus on? I mean, any of them, anything, but um, yeah. It's also different communities like to turn to um, specific people they know have helped their friends. Yep. Like if their friends are elderly, and the, this particular coach helped them, then they know they have like an automatic trust for, for these people. You yep. know, the same as, you know, yep. the, the other end of the spectrum, you know, for early childhood. So I think it works that way also because uh, people need to have, I guess, something like branding, you yep. know? <laughs> yeah, they do. Uh, yeah, they do. What do you want to say? Well, I just was saying, okay, if you so I want to do everything you. under the sun, then everybody's like, uh, that doesn't, because they don't know if you can help them, you know? So yeah, you do need to narrow in on what that means. You know, what is it that you're going to mm -hmm. do? Because you're going to have like, yeah, exactly. You're exactly right. Well, I'll let you ask your next question. I'll just keep rambling on. Okay. You are certainly aware, because people reach out to you, of the all the excruciatingly painful chronic sickness and dysfunction that a large part, percentage of our families are enduring and breaking from. Do you believe that complete healing is actually possible using the vast number of available non-toxic physical, emotional, and spiritual modalities without any use of the what I call draconian medical or pharma model? That's my question. <laughs> my answer is of course. Of course. Of course. We may, okay. So let's, let's look at the history of human health. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We've got, you know, we had a, low, a shorter lifespan because we used to get eaten and, and, you know, die of disease and all that kind of stuff. But we did at one point have a shorter lifespan. But if we look at what we know today, combined with what the assaults are that we have today, like we're really actually um, destroying what we actually know about the human body, like destroying that um, I guess the leg up that we would have with all of the stuff that we think we're doing to actually improve that by interfering with the natural process of the human body. So I think that human body, uh, we have an innate desire, ability to heal always, always. And that's why we focus on the immune system because that is the only thing that's going to get us well. Now, if we're consistently and constantly assaulting that immune system with chemicals, EMF exposure, poor diet, you know, like unhealthy fats and, you know, lack of sleep, not giving ourselves rest. Like if we're constantly doing that um, and allowing that to happen, we are damaging our immune system. We are either hyper, you know, making them hyper re responsive and creating autoimmune conditions, or we are, you know, burdening it so much that it doesn't know what to do with all of the pathogenic assaults that it's getting. And it doesn't know what to do with the heavy metals and the chemicals that are interfering with those biochemical processes. So if you have like, um, but, and then you also look at the development of the human body and human history of health, um, we are, we actually grew, like we evolved with the botanicals that are on our earth. We, we, we rely on the soil to actually put 
the proper nutrients, the proper minerals balance into the, the, the foods that are actually growing from that soil. Now, we've messed with that, stripped the, the soil of the, the nutrients that it needs to actually grow proper food, and then we spray the hell out of the food and then create like I, neoisotopes that the body can't even know, doesn't know what to do with. Like it's not even a, an actual um, component or chemical or nutrient that it can use. And then we're destroying the microbiome. So we, our bodies, we need a really good um, balance of microbes within the gut um, and also other places in the body, by the way, on the skin, in the brain. We have a microbiome all over the place. And those are actually the little critters, the microbes, that actually digest our food, that actually make the, the proper neurochemicals so we have good mental health. And we're actually um, destroying those by using a pest, pesticides on our food. And then in turn, it destroys all of the, the microbiome in the, inside the body as well as on, on the skin. So um, and in the soil as well. So we're actually creating this, 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 this um, I guess, a, a situation where we have, like, we're actually making it really hard for our bodies to do what they need to do. And we can't replicate that. We can't destroy it and say, well, we'll just take a bunch of probiotics and we'll fix it up. Because we can do some, we can do some. But I'm finding more and more and more with my clients as well as people that I know and I see and that I research and I speak to other people who are doing this work and other, other clinicians and researchers, we're seeing more and more where I've, it's getting increasingly difficult to actually rectify this with a simple, you know, protocol of like maybe, you know, better food and more nutrients and, and, and using like probiotics, right? So we need to actually really overhaul all of that and start with the foundation because we can't actually repl replicate what the body's doing. So let's say we take an antibiotic. Okay, well, yeah, we'll kill the bad bacteria. Alarm disease. Oh, Example, alarm right? disease. Yes. And we're, we're, we're actually sometimes not even killing the pathogen. Sometimes we're just killing the good stuff. And then, um, so yeah, and it's non-discriminant most of the time. And so it will kill the, the healthy microbiome. And then what moves in is what's opportunistic. So what's around, you know, what, what you can contract all kinds of other different um, pathogens that are not healthy, have overgrowth in other ones. You know, it leaves room for all those, those um the pathogens that are not really helping us out to overgrow. Although there will be some, but we don't want them to overgrow. We need balance. So what we're doing by using something in place of the immune system, like an antibiotic, instead of like a natural antibiotic or letting the body fight its own battles, what we're doing is we're creating imbalance and then we're, our bodies actually are not equipped to do that. So we have an uneducated immune system, right? An immune system that's not, so, but, in, in like, ideally, we want that immune system to do what it's supposed to do. So a long, long story short, what I'm saying to your question, Ita, is that um, what needs to happen is to return to that natural, like not pharmaceutical state of, of health, because there's no such thing. I mean, there's no such thing. That's just managing symptoms. That's just trying to get us by. We might need to resort to something like a pharmaceutical if we have like a limb that was cut off and we have in so much pain and we need to sew it on and we need to like block that pain so we can just like survive. Like that's what it's for and that's where it shines. You know, survival, survival medicine. Yes, emergency surgery. That's what medicine is for. And we're looking to it for something that it's not designed to do, like chronic illness, prevention. Um, long-lasting health that's not what it's designed to do so even when we criticize the medical profession for not stepping up and doing what we you know having longer um, you know like half an hour an hour long visits and like you know dealing with diet and nutrition all that like okay we all need to know this and that's, what. that's not what they're that's not what it's designed to do so it's not even fair to look to that to the to medicine to heal us from chronic illness we have all of the tools. Our bodies already know how to do it. And we have many, like a plethora of, of therapies if we need to go that route. We've got like homeopathy. We have chiropractic. We have, um, you know, dealing with the central nervous system and trauma release. We have like, I don't know, I could just keep going on and on and on and on. Like we, we can test Hundreds. functional lab work. We have like, we have um, orthomolecular medicine. You know, we've got where we can, you know, 
ad adjust and, and um, you know, use bio individuality to lead us to know what nutrients we're deficient in and which ones we need to, you know, improve on, which like we, we have all of those tools and we just don't need to know how to use them. But absolutely, we can do that naturally. And I actually think that reversal of chronic illness um, the only way to do that is to look toward what the body can do and how we can do that naturally. I think that's the only way. Great. I have a very important question. Yeah. Our mama bears have grown up following authority and not taking responsibility for their families because it seems like, you know, just the system has the responsibility. Can you connect somehow, see the HFF practitioners um, like come into the communities and somehow rejuvenate, educate mothers to stand up to, you know, and, and like moms across America and to stand up and change, you know, change the system. I mean, we're talking about um, legislating medication on our babies. Mm -hmm. Like you have to do what we say. We're talking about medical kidnapping. Mm -hmm. You know, when a child is diagnosed, no, you need to do our treatment. How do we get the mothers, the grassroots, more of the grassroots? There are, there it's growing, but <laughs> there's a lot of pushback. Yeah. A lot of pushback. Yeah. yeah. And we, I was talking about fear. Um, I'm glad you're asking. Like you're, you're asking some questions that a lot of people are going to go, you know, because it, it's like, it's a really, um, it's a hard topic because anytime we talk about something like, you know, that sort of becomes a little more political, it's like, it can instigate uh, like fear, right? Because well, what if we rock the boat and rocking the boat can bring on some water in that boat and you can sink, you know, <laughs> like it's like people get scared. And I think, um, I think that we need to support each other. Um, first understanding that us moms, we are very powerful. And I think that moms are in the best position to do the most, make the most change. Even if you're only ready to make that change within your own family, that is just fine. Not all of us are going to want to start nonprofit groups or, you know, march on the streets or, you know, and I, that's wonderful. I think that's really, really important to show that kind of support. But if you are not in that position and not ready to do it, you have a lot of opposition in your, in your own family, you know, you have maybe even a partner who is opposed to your thoughts or, you know, some people aren't in a position to do that outwardly, but they really want to make a change for their own children. And that is just fine. Um, and then, uh, and then some people are teachers. Some people are really good at teaching, you know, people, I'm not talking about being pushy, you know, because that's not, I don't think, I don't find that helpful. Um, I think no, I just, just being on the same side, being just, the, you know, being aligned supporting each other supporting each other and I think that's what's really really important is to, su to support each other so being aware is actually number one because let's say okay I'm always trying to bring us back to like examples of you know the real life like this is okay we can talk about this but we like what do we do here like you know what what do you do when you're going to like a potluck and everybody's bringing a bunch of crap and your kid can't eat that and you know I mean, what do you do in those situations? Well, you bring something you're found, you can eat, you bring something that you want other people to benefit from. And then if other parents say, hey, what's in this? And you tell them, and then the next time you do it, somebody else is gonna bring something like that. And so it's not about like, I'm better than you, and I know more, and I, or I get, it's like, I'm this snob, and I <laughs> eat organic, and I never touch that GMO stuff. And like, you know, no, it's not about that. You might think that. Sometimes I'm just like, gross, and I, I, I eat that, but you know, but then like, you know, so it's a more of an accepting way of, of looking at it and, and understanding like, this is what everybody has been taught. And they, actually a lot of people just really don't know. So it's a matter of just having conversations and leading, like I said, leading by example and supporting each other. So if you know that there's a child on that sports team that has an allergy to gluten, let's say they're celiac, but your kids are fine. You still eat gluten, bring something that's gluten free. So everybody can eat it and just don't just rely on that person to take care of their own kids and bring their own stuff if you're the manager of that it's team changed, if you're the coach mindset. That team, yeah you do you make that change for that kid and support that family and those moms are going to do the same for you and so that's how we do it we we support each other and in in our own communities in our own families and in our 
broader world. So whatever we do out there. So, you know, you go to work and you're bringing, you know, like something like that, like something better for everybody to eat. You're, you know, you can spread that just what, with other stuff that you do, you know, encouraging all that kind of stuff. You're going, you know, out with some friends and you're, you know, like you park like far away from the door, you know, like it's just like stuff like that. I think it's really important, but I do think that the support of each other is, is essential because I think I've heard of so many women and I say women, I know there's of course men and dads and grandpas and actually I have a grandpa who's very active, you know, he replies to me all the time, but you know, a lot of moms are feeling alone. And there is no reason for that at all, like at all. They feel alone. So I think those Facebook groups are wonderful. I think they're really good for support. You have to be careful with what information that you actually act upon because not everybody understands the concept of bioindividuality. Not everything's going to work well for one person that works for another. But I think that this sense of community is very important. I think that um, anecdotal evidence is just as important as research. I think research is exceptionally important, but I also think that it's not the only thing. And I think research can be skewed. We, should, we, we don't always research the things we need oh, to yeah. I mean, and I, so I think like if you see a community of people and they're just getting better and like, and they eat well and they do all this kind of stuff, that's evidence for me that it's working, right? Or you see like, so I think that taking those things into account, just being really smart about thinking about it. And like I said, moms will fight to the death for their children. Like they are a formidable force and they are the ones that are going to change the world and they are they're they're the ones that i'm just like yeah they're the ones that are doing it so i want you moms to draw from your strength of your fellow moms but yourself and and start to trust yourself and and if you feel like you don't know find out just find out if you feel scared and you're like i don't know if i should do this find out and then you, and then you'll be able to be more confident in your decisions. So, um, yeah. So I, I feel like that's what we need to do is support and to really find the strength within ourselves because you know that if some there's a threat to your family, like it's the mom who's gonna like save everybody. Like, like that mom is gonna just kick some butt. <laughs> and we'll do it together. Get rid yeah. of the GMOs. More organic. We're gonna. Yeah. All the way through to the government. <laughs> Put exactly. the women back. Exactly. Back into power. Yeah. 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 Well, I am very grateful for your helping me do my Shiro's journey. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah. you know, um, thank you for all your support because this, this is, it just feels so right to do this, to, you know, the classes are so much fun and I hope just through this amazing summit that you're doing, there'll be people wanting to help their own communities and uh, join our eclectic group. <laughs> so uh, thank you. And do um, you have any other questions? <laughs> yeah, you know what, Ita, thank you. I appreciate you doing this. I, uh, I put this call out there to see, you know, like to have these conversations so that, um, uh, I could, the shoe could be on the other foot and to introduce you to our community. And I think that your Shiro's journey, Ita, is a mighty one. And so I think that um, I, I'm just really glad that you took me up on this. And I just, and this was wonderful. I really enjoyed this. And I really appreciate you being an interviewer for the Children's uh, Health Summit 4. And I think we should wrap up now. And thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>